The message today is entitled, He Will Return, Part 3. He Will Return, Part 3. In Part 1 and Part 2, if nobody has heard Part 1 or 2, go back to our YouTube channel. You'll see it there. You can hear it uh, in order to, for Part 3 to make sense. But you'll hear, hear Part 3. Um, I do want to say this. Part two spoke on directly to Grace Christian Center about the importance of where we are right now. Where we are right now and, and what, what is the immediate attention that Grace Christian, Center has, Grace Christian Center has been called to. And so um, if you were not able to watch last week's message, uh, he, he Will Return Part 2, please do so if you can. Today will be the last part of He Will Return, Part 3. I want to speak to you about this. Um, for those who have been coming to the Monday night Bible study, we've been talking about all that good stuff, about the book of Revelation, about mystery, Babylon, the great harlot. We talked about how, how the Antichrist will, when he arrives, this final Antichrist, when he arrives, he is going to rule all the world. And it's going to be in a sense, through the harlot, the great harlot, mystery, Babylon. And so we know today that the Bible teaches that Babylon will, will rise up as again, as a, as a great influence in the world. Um, we know that the first great kingdom of the earth was Babylon, biblically, so to speak. It was Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar, many, many thousands of years ago, he marched into Jerusalem and he stole the things of God. He, he stole them. He took the people of God. He took the, the artifacts and the temple of God. And he took it all the way to a heathen Gentile nation. All the way to Iraq. To Baghdad. South of Baghdad. That, that's where modern day Babylon is. And so the, this was because of the disobedience of the Jewish people. Their disobedience to God. And so God loves us. Sometimes he will allow our, our enemies to a certain degree run over us to get our attention, to say, hey, we need God in all of life situations. God did not abandon them. But what God did allow is he allowed his people to go through times of, of temptation and persecution and trials and tribulations. Why? Because these, this could be used as a learning tool for God's people, even so today. And so I want to show you in the book of Daniel chapter 1, I want to read this to you quickly. I'm going to move fast today, guys, okay? So bear with me, please. In Daniel chapter 1, it, it begins the story of how Nebuchadnezzar went into the, to Israel, to Judah, and took the things of God, took the people of God. Now, we understand in the book of Revelation that Babylon, the mystery harlot, Babylon, will rise again in the world. I want to show you the character, just character trait number one of what mystery Babylon, the ancient spirit, what it has always done, what it did in the days of Daniel, and what it, do, it will, has already done in today's time. And you know because you, this will be undeniable evidence. In Daniel 1, let me read this to you. In verse 1 it says, In the third year of the reign of Joachim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave the king, uh, Jehoiakim, he gave of Judah into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought, King Nebuchadnezzar brought the articles into the treasure house of his false god. Verse 3, Then the king instructed Asphenes, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles young men in whom there was no blemish but good looking gifted in all wisdom possessing knowledge and quick to understand they had the ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans and so King Nebuchadnezzar appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before King Nebuchadnezzar now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And to them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He renamed them Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, 
uh, Meshach, Abednego, Shadrach. These are all different names. Verse 8 says this, he changed their names. Watch this. In verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies and nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, King Nebuchadnezzar, who has appointed you to eat certain food and drink. Why should he see your faces looking worse than these other young men who are of your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, he said, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies as you see fit. So deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, verse 15, their features appeared better and fatter and flesh than all the rest of the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. I want to read that to you because of this very reason. That is always the traits of Babylon. The first thing Babylon did when they went into the house of God and into the people of God is that they took the best of the best from Israel and they made them become eunuchs. And what did they do? What does it mean to be a eunuch? Do you know what that means? To castrate a young man. They took the men and they castrated them. That number one character trait of Babylon is to change the gender. Change the gender. To question your gender. And that is what we see happening today in the world. Wanting to change their gender. Even to the degree where they go to surgeons to castrate themselves. To change their bi bi biological anatomy, their, their body. But you see, Daniel had no choice in this. And Daniel said, fine, you're going to make me a eunuch. You're going to take away what makes me a man. He goes, but I will not drink of your wine and of your choice foods. He says, you cannot make me do that. The Bible says in verse 8 that Daniel purposed in his heart to not defile himself. And you see, that is what today is happening in the world. This mystery harlot Babylon, as recorded in the book of Revelation, that is what it is doing all over again in the world for the past, what? Especially the past 15 years, maybe? It has brought into question everyone in the world to want to change their gender, to want to accept these ulterior lifestyles and things like that. That has been the work of the mystery harlot Babylon as recorded in the Bible in the end times that is what we see happening before our very eyes it's happening all over again and that tells me we are so close to his return we are so close to his return I can go on and on and on from the book of Daniel about all the things that Babylon does from attacking your prayer life to attacking your things with your relationship with God as they did with Daniel and that is what that is what is happening to Christianity around the world you think about that you know Americans are so cl clueless to this I had a pastor tell me here recently that the that the underground church in North Korea is strong is strong and they're underground they're meeting in dark places of darkness because it is forbidden to speak the things of Jesus Christ. You will be put to death. You will be put to death on the spot. There is no questioning to this. But so many Americans are clueless to the persecutions of Christianity in Saudi Arabia. That is why Saudi Arabia here recently has been a pushing and pushing to have all of these, uh, th these martial arts, sports fights, all of these venues in Saudi Arabia to try to make Saudi Arabia look like a civilized nation. When underground 
They're murdering. It, they're destroying. There, there is an underground in Saudi Arabia as well, an underground church in Saudi Arabia as well. Why? Because Jesus is coming. Jesus said, when this message has gone all the way around the world, Jesus said, then the end shall come. The message began in Israel, and it went westward. It went to the European nations. It went all the way around to the New World, to America. It went, uh, went all the way around, came back around through, through the Asian world, through Africa continent, and now it's right there in the Middle East, right about to come back into Jerusalem. It's literally 2,000 years it has taken to go around the world. Influence. The greatest wall that Christianity has faced is right there in the Middle East. And it's the fiercest fight. And that is what is happening that we see. Now in the timeline of, of part one of this message and part two of this message, so we can get into part three immediately right now, I want to show you this. There will be, a, 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 we are in today, right now, we are in the church age. Just to brush you up on this, we are in the church age. When Jesus died and rose from the dead and went back to heaven and the Holy Spirit came, in Acts chapter 2, it was the birth of the church. That began the church age. For the past 2,000 years, God has been bringing in Gentiles from all walks of life into the family of God. We are adopted not into the Baptist church, not into the Catholic church, not into the Pentecostal church. We are adopted into the church of Jesus Christ. We are adopted into the family of God. It's not being a Baptist or any other denomination that's going to save you. It's a real personal relationship with Jesus Christ that saves you. Amen. And that is why I tell people, read the Bible for yourself. It's God's love letter to you. So many Christians today put the love letter of God down. They only read it on a Sunday when the pastor's reading out of the passage. This is God's love letter that should be read every day to remind you of his faithfulness, of his power, of his redeeming grace, of his mercy. Amen. Amen. It's your directions in life. It's your safety manual. It's, it, it tells you what to do, how to do it, when to do it. Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. So for the past 2,000 years, the church has been flowing and growing. The Bible teaches us, not Michael, not a, not a church. The Bible teaches us we are coming to the end of the church age. It is at the event of the rapture of the church. When God's people are caught up in the air and suddenly we're vanished. Look, look at your phone. Do you see this phone right here? This will be viral. The catching up of God's people will be caught and it will be shared virally throughout the world. Pastors can make up words, you know that, right? It will be shared virally. We can make up our own words. Hallelujah. You got it that now, didn't you? It will be viral when God's people are suddenly caught up and meet Jesus in the air. That is what you call, listen, listen, please listen. That is what you call the rapture of the church. The catching up of God's people. We talked about that in chapter, in part one and part two. Immediately, immediately, and even, it, I don't know the exact timing of the rapture and the arrival of the Antichrist. I don't know. I personally believe we will witness the Antichrist. We will go through some things. That's just my opinion. But when the church is gone, there will be a man who will come on the earth. And be, the people will believe that that man is Jesus. They will believe that he is the Christ, the Messiah. Because for so many years, listen, the world has been hearing the Christian church say, Jesus is coming back, Jesus is coming back. But when you know what the Bible says, the Bible says that Christ is coming for his church to take them to heaven. Jesus says, I go away. In John chapter 14, verse 1, I go away to prepare a place in my Father's house and I will come back to get you to be with me in my Father's house. Heaven. So when Jesus comes for the church and um, millions of people suddenly vanish, there will be one man on the earth that will say, this is why the vanishing happened. And this is what we need to do. We need to come together every way in every walk of life. You see, it's already happening right now. The world is pushing for a one 
type of opinion. And if you speak the things of God in this world today, they'll hate you. They'll call you a racist, a bigot, a homophobic. That you're not just getting with the times. We have to evolve. You know, it's those same people that say that humans come from monkeys and lizards. It's those same people that will say those millions of people that suddenly disappeared, that's called evolution. Those who have left, we're evolving. We are evolving into a new species. So let's follow this one man who says he is the Christ, that he is God. Okay? That was in part one and part two. In part two, now into part three. We read last week how the Lord Jesus Christ will come down and he will strike the nations. This is known as the second coming of Christ. The rapture and the second coming of Christ. So this is the timeline. The rapture, the catching up of God's people, and then the arrival of the final Antichrist on the world. He will rule the world for seven years. Seven years. At the end of the seven years, the second coming of Christ. Jesus will come and he will strike down the kingdom of Satan on the earth. And everybody who chose to accept the mark of the beast, the Bible says that they will be cast into hell. And Jesus, at the second coming, he will set up his earthly kingdom, and Jesus will reign on this earth, this ground, for 1,000 years. People say the end of the world is coming. It is not coming. Amen. The end of this world is nowhere near the end. We're coming, listen, we're coming to the end of the age. Just like there was the age of Noah's flood, there was the age of the patriarchs, the Old Testament, now we're in the New Testament. We're in the church age, and the church age is coming to an end. We're now getting ready to head into the age of tribulation, a seven-year tribulation age. And when that tribulation age ends, the second coming of Christ will happen. And then we'll begin the 1,000-year reign of Christ on the earth, a new age. At the end of that 1,000-year age, then the end will come. Let's read this. Revelation 20, verse 1. Jesus has just, the, the new age is about to begin. The age of the, of the church is done. The age of the seven-year tribulation of the Antichrist is done. And now we're entering into the age of the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on this physical earth. Verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain Revelation 20 verse 1 and a great chain in his hand he laid hold of the dragon that serpent of old who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and he cast him into the bottomless pit and he shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished but after these things he must be released for a little while. When Jesus Christ comes back a second time, the second time, the first time Jesus came was when he was a baby. You get what I'm saying? The second time he comes, we read in Revelation 19 how he will come on a white horse, breaking through the heavens with the Christians, the army of God coming, the armies of heaven coming with him. This sounds like a, like a video game, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound like a fantasy? But it's real, guys. This is really happening. You know, there are two realms that are happening. The realm of time. And then the realm of eternity. And those two realms are not the same. You see, look. You see the person to your left and to your right? This is a temporary realm. And sadly, the only way you believe in this realm is what you see. There's another realm. The eternal realm. Angels. Demons. Where God is, even in this realm, God is here, God is there, God is everywhere. But you see, that realm has to be embraced by faith, believing in things unseen. You hear me? But the obstacle you have, Christian, today is that in order to believe the things unseen, you need to not allow the things that you can't see to sway that opinion of what the Bible says, that things that are unseen are real. One day... Let the Lord, and uh, again, let's read this again. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit 
and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that's Satan, the serpent of old who was the devil and Satan. And he bound Satan, look, look at that, for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Look guys, Satan's on the loose right now. Amen. Yes? The devil is on the loose. There's going to come a point in time when we're going to enter into an age where the devil will be bound for a thousand years. A thousand human years. This is a new age where, that we're currently heading towards. The church age is coming to an end. Understand there's not much time left to repent of your sins and to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There's not much time left. While everybody is eating and drinking and carrying on, Mystery Babylon, the harlot, trying to get you to change your gender, trying to get you to change your, your view of God, what God taught us from when we were babies. It's happening today, and the devil will be cast down. Verse 3, he cast him into the bottomless pit and he shut him up for a seal on him and put a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, the devil must be released for a short season. Verse 4, and I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. They did not worship the Antichrist, the beast, or his image. And they did not receive his mark on their foreheads or their hands. And they lived with Christ a thousand years. You know what? Do you want to, let me just tell you this. When I read this, let me tell you something. In my day, tattoos were not as big as tattoos are today. In my day, the accepting of homosexuality and sexual morality was not as big as it is today. You want to know why? Because in the ministry of, in, when the Antichrist rules on seven year tribulation age, he's going to cause everyone to receive a mark on them of his number. And you will not be able to buy, sell, eat, trade, do anything unless you have the mark of the beast. And it's going to be so easy for people because they're freely marking their bodies up already. This art that they put on their body, it, it, it's, it, it's it, you know, it's, it's, it's art. Wow. You know, my, my, my thought is this. I, I'm not judging anybody, but here's what I am doing. It desensitizes you that if you don't have a rel relationship with Jesus Christ and you begin to mark your body up and you find yourself left behind, not getting caught up in the rapture because you were not a Christian and you end up yourself with this antichrist who will rule the world in, in just three and a half years, over two billion people will die at his hand. Why? Because that's what the devil brings, death. And it will be so easy for people to mark their bodies because they're already doing it now. It will be so easy for people to follow the lies of the devil because they're already following the lies now. Verse 5, but the rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed is he who is holy and who has part in the first resurrection, because over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God in Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. This is the church. The church will reign with Christ a thousand years. The second death will have no power over those who follow Jesus Christ. Why? What is the second death? The lake of fire. We're going to find out what that lake of fire is. Here you go. Verse 7, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and he will go to deceive the nations where they are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle and whose number is the sand of the sea. And they went up to the breadth of the earth and they surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and they devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was cast, look, not into hell, but into the lake of fire. of brimstone where the beast and the false prophet have been and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever you see because this is the eternal realm and the eternal realm is forever and ever the eternal realm is forever and ever we are in a temporary realm this temporary realm will not exist forever so you, Christian, are in a temporary situation making eternal decisions. If you're on your way to heaven, 
live now, prepare yourself now as you are already in heaven. Because the kingdom of God is in you when you accept the Christ as your Lord and Savior. You shouldn't have these struggles, even though you will have struggles. Does that make sense? You will have victory over these things. Do you want victory? Many times Jesus said, do you want to be healed? Jesus didn't say, come, let me heal you. He didn't do that. Jesus said, do you want to be healed? Because here's the fact. A lot of people today do not want to be healed. They know they're sick. They know they're hurting. They know they're in pain, but they do not want to be healed. And Jesus illustrates this, points this out very clear, clearly when he walked the earth. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be set free from all of these things that you know don't belong in your life? If you're on your way to heaven, live. Act like you're on your way to heaven. Live it out now. What is it that's afflicting your life right now? You know it's not in heaven. Why are you doing it now? Doesn't the Bible say with God all things are possible? Doesn't the Bible says I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Either God is a liar or you're the liar. We're the liars. I don't care what it is you're struggling with. I don't care what it is. The blood of Jesus can wash it. Amen. The blood of Jesus can heal it. Amen. We, we're in the business of making excuses. We're in the business of reasoning and compromising. You know, I, I put myself in a situation here Friday and Saturday because, you know, I, I like to kind of be left alone a lot. That's just the way I am. And Friday and Saturday, I, I made myself committed to certain obligations to go and do a couple of things. And I find myself on both occasions trying to say, well, let me, let me just say I can't make it because uh, this came up or that came up. But then I thought to myself, well, Michael, then you're just lying. I know I can't lie. I can't do that. Let me, let me honor and go. Because it's not that I don't like the people or anything. like. I just, sometimes I just, I'm like that. And God knows I'm like that. And that's why God puts me out there like that. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. But, uh, but at the end of the day, you're glad you go out there. You're glad that you made yourself a part of those things, right? And it's the same way with church. You know, you don't see the importance of coming to church, being a part of the fellowship, but you put yourself there and, and you, afterwards you're like, thank you, Lord. Man, this is exactly what I needed. Amen? Look, the devil will burn in the lake of fire forever and ever. The lake of fire and hell are not the same place. Watch. Let's read this. Verse 11. John says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it and whose face the earth and the heaven had fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead small and great standing before God and books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life look and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books the sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades hell it delivered up the death who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Look, guys, this is the second death. Anyone whose not name not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Look, look at that. I want you to look at that. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. How do you get your name in the book of life? The Bible teaches us that you must repent of your sins, receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you shall be saved. From what? The lake of fire. This is at the judgment throne of God in Revelation 20. This is known as the great white throne judgment. You don't want to know why it's called the great white throne judgment. You want to know why? In verse 11 it says, I saw a great white throne and God sat on it. Because white is symbolic for the holiness of God. It's pure. And all people who will stand at this judgment, they live their life on earth in abomination towards God. And blaspheming towards God. They did what they wanted to do, which was sinful. And it, 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 what Jesus came to save you. But you 
the sinners lived a life on earth that was denouncing of what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever will believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And so when you live a life on this earth that's sinful and dishonoring of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, then you leave God no other choice but at the end of your day to bring you to the great white throne judgment. And your name will not be found in the book of life. Look, verse 15 again. And so therefore, you will be cast into the lake of fire. Well, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth forever and ever. I didn't say it. The word of God said it. You know, if I go into another Christian church, many Christian churches in this nation, and say these things, they would kick me right out the door. You want to know why? Because sadly, so many churches today are getting away from what the Word of God says. Because that's what empties the seats in churches, the Word of God. Jesus even said it. What did Jesus Christ, the Son of God, say about the end time? He said, the road to heaven is narrow and only a few shall find it. This is what Jesus said. And Jesus said, but the road to hell is wide and many shall find it. You got to be narrow-minded to follow Jesus. And isn't that what they call us today? You're against this and you're against that Christian. And Christian, you, you, you're a homophobic, you're a racist. No, no, no. It's not that I'm against hom homosexuals. It's not that I'm against liars and thieves and drunkards. It's not that I'm against these, these people who do these things, who live in idolatry. No, no, no. Because I was once one of those people. I don't hate them. But as a human being, as someone who lives on the face of this earth as a Christian, I need to be careful that I don't get involved in that lifestyle all over again. And I do understand that I need to follow Jesus. And as I follow Jesus, hopefully they will see my relationship with Christ and I can love them to the cross. Not denounce them and tell them, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. No, no. I'm speaking these things because this is what the Word of God warns us about, that this is what will happen to those who refuse Jesus Christ. And it is our responsibility as Christians to speak the truth. More importantly, to live by the truth. Amen. You hear what I'm saying this morning? Because he will return. The Antichrist is coming, but Jesus will return. The world has taught us throughout history that the devil has always tried to conquer the world through dictators, emperors, kings, evil men. And God has always said throughout history, not yet, not yet, not yet. We are coming to a point where God will say, now, Satan, this is your final false messiah. And the door will be opened and he will usher into the world. And this final Antichrist will make Hitler, Mussolini, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, American presidents, you name them, all of them look like kindergartners in the class of evil. The whole world will be deceived by him. What I mean the whole world is those who do not know Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's one thing to say, I believe in Jesus. It's another thing to be in Jesus. Amen. Because the Bible says that even demons believe. When Jesus walked the face of the earth, there were demons that were possessing people and they would say, the Son of God! Even demons believe Jesus is the Son of God. And there are so many people that say, oh, hallelujah, yeah, God's good, amen, but they live a life of sin. It's one thing to believe Jesus, but it's another thing to be in Jesus. And that is what you need to be in Christ and Christ in you. Because that is what saves you. That is what redeems you. He will return. And the Bible says here clearly that there is coming a judgment. We've read this. A judgment is coming. You know, it's so funny, though. 
I've had many pastors throughout my almost 17 years as a senior pastor here condemn me for talking about judgment when all I'm doing is reading what the Bible says. Amen. You know, I'm not a prophet and I don't even like calling myself a pastor. But what I do feel comfortable calling myself is a watchman. And what a watchman is, as recorded in the book of Ezekiel, is someone who has received the truth of God and if they don't warn the people, then the blood will be on my hands. And we have a lot of pastors and a lot of teachers, but we don't have many watchmen. And if you notice, the true watchmen of God, they don't have a great following and they could care less about the following because they're busy following Jesus. You know, the Lord allowed me to be a pastor for a reason. Because those who knew me before Christ understood that I was so far out in left field. But over these past 17 years as a pastor, I've had to learn. I've had to learn so many. And I still have a long way to go. A long way to go. But I'm willing to learn. And to humble yourself. And to stop thinking you know everything. And that you have the answers to everything. But one thing I, I can't feel comfortable in saying is that, you know, the Lord has told me this is what's coming because I see what the Bible says and I look out there and the Spirit says, you see, Michael, there, look, Michael, over here, look, Michael, over there. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. And that's why, you know, my original hat as a ministry was an evangelist. I was an evangelist for years before I was a, a pastor. And I think that's why sometimes people kind of are afraid to talk to me. Because they see me in the eyes of the flesh. You know, I mean, at the same time, I have my own walk. But I think if we walk with Jesus, we can walk together. But that's why I have an urgency. You hear it in, in the message God gives to me. That I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how healthy you are. I don't care how sick you are. I don't care how sick you are. I don't care how healthy you are. When I see people like Miss Faye, who was a walking testimony, that she's going to do it until the very end of her life. Amen. She was led to this church for a reason. We are in the business of making excuses and reasoning with God. And that business needs to shut down. Because many have been called, but only a few have been chosen. I'm telling you, I have seen. I have seen, and there's things I've never shared with anybody, not even my wife. But there is great bloodshed coming to this nation. The Constitution will be done away with. And the church will be driven underground. All the while, the Lord has told me, we need to be faithful now. Because God is going to shake His church, and God is going to shake this earth once again. Instead of looking at the preacher and saying, hey man, you're too harsh. You're too... Look to the cross. Look to Jesus. Let go of that, that, that drink. Let go of that smoke, of that vape. You know, people come into the church, they're excited for a season. Then all of a sudden they drift away. Because Satan stole what God had put into your heart. Satan stole it. The parable of the seeds. The four parables of the sea. I'm tired of seeing Satan steal things. I'm tired of it. And the only way that I know how you survive is by being faithful to the church because Jesus is faithful to the church. Do you hear what I said? Jesus is faithful to his church. So you be faithful to his church. It's not about your Christian life. It's not about you. It's about him and serving I've heard so many people talk, and the, oh, theologically, they know it is, they know that. But they honor him with lips, but their hearts are so far. I'm not just here on Mondays and Wednesdays. I'm here every day. And you say, well, Michael, you live over there. No, that was not my choice. God made me live here. God made me have a church in Alvin. 
And I chose to obey to follow. And one thing I do know of the Lord will keep me in his grace. That I'm going to do this until the day of my last, very last breath. I've always said it. I said, you know, I, I don't care if I just sit down on the couch in my living room with two or three people. I'm going to do this till the day I die. Why? Because I am obligated to Christ. He saved my soul. And everybody may abandon. And everybody may walk away, but I can't walk away from the, the cross of Jesus again. Amen. I can't do that. And I'm not going to do that. Because he will return. In Revelation 21, 1. Oh, praise God. Satan tried to put up a billion at the end of the thousand year reign. And this time God just says, uh-uh. Fire came down and destroyed Satan. Destroyed the people on the earth the, who were repopulated over the thousand year reign of Christ. Can you believe that? During the thousand year reign of Jesus on the earth. There was no devil, no demons on the earth, all absent. The only people on the earth during that thousand year age is Jesus, the resurrected church, and the human beings who lived through the tribulation, who refused the Antichrist. During that thousand year reign, those human beings repopulated the earth. And in the course of a thousand years, that last generation is the generation, watch this, that said, even though we see physically Jesus ruling, we'd rather choose Satan. And God put the end to that rebellion when Satan was released from his prison at the end of the thousand years. That is what we see happening right now. The true church of Jesus Christ is alive. It's filled with power. Amen? These words that I'm saying, they're fire to the soul. Because it's not my word, it's his word. You undeniably, those who are watching this video, undeniably, you cannot deny what I am saying at this pulpit because it's the word of God. It's the fire of God. And I'm telling you, get right or get left. Get right or get left. I don't care if you've been a Christian a long time. I don't care if you said you were filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Spirit of God. I don't care. Get right or get left. Many have been called and many have been anointed. It's time to be sharpened and be used for the goodness of God. It's time. The time is now. The time is now. The time is now. In the twinkle of an eye. In the twinkle of an eye. Like a thief in the night. Like a thief in the night. He will return. Stop making excuses. Because this is my goal right here. At the end of the thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. Revelation 21, 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And also there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. This is the, Christ, this is the church. This is you church and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying behold the tabernacle of God is with men and God will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God look at this and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes there shall be no more death nor sorrow nor crying there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away and then he who sat on the throne said behold I make all things new and he said to me write for these words are true and faithful verse 6 and God said to me it is done I am the alpha the omega the beginning and the end God says I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to anyone who thirsts he who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is God talking. This is God talking. And yet so many preachers today will not dare utter these words in church. 
Do you see how far, how far so many Christian denominations have walked away from the truths of God? But you're going to hold on to the Pope. You're going to hold on to the superintendent of the Baptist faith, the Baptist convention. You're going to hold on to the superintendent of the assemblies of God, of the Pentecostal faith. You're going to hold on to these things. But yet in their churches, there's no more power. There's no more fire of the Holy Spirit. I believe my time is limited here. I'm on short time. You know, more and more I'm starting to have dreams again and again and again, every day. And, and I'm telling you, get right or get left. Because it's going to happen so fast. I know that for the members here at Grace Christian Center, there is work to be done. There is work to be done. And I choose to say, Lord Jesus, you are worthy of this work. Lord Jesus, we will finish. Because you are in us and we are in you. And if we're following you, you're going you're gonna to do great things. We're going to see incredible things happen within the, the body of Christ. I don't know if there's going to be a revival in this earth. I'm not going to dare say there will not because I'm not going to limit God to anything. But I do know this. The Bible-believing Christian on the earth right now, there's no reason for you to be in revival. To have the joy of the Lord, the peace of the Lord, to have peace in your home, to have the joy of God in your home. It's time to throw out the old and allow the Holy Spirit to dwell in that house. That song we sang, Make Me a House of Prayer. You're always praying, you're always speaking to God, whether in your car, in your home, you're always speaking to the Lord. And in doing that, He's going to be teaching you things and speaking to you. It's time to allow the Holy Spirit to prepare you for heaven. Stop holding on to the things of this earth. You're bickering, you're complaining, you're gossiping, you're slander, you're speaking evil of anybody. Now, now I'm not talking to any one of you, I'm just talking to people on the line, okay? So don't, don't throw nothing at me. But you're complaining, you're bickering, you're gossiping, you're slandering, you're, you're foul mouth, you're laughing at those perverted jokes. You know, um, um, uh, somebody in my family brought this to my attention the other day. They were saying that the state of Texas is putting bans on certain porno pornographic websites. And I told this, I'm like, how do you know? Did you go look? And they're like, yeah, I sure did. I'm like, <laughs> but praise God. Praise God that, that, that we have leaders that are looking at this as I did this. Well, we cannot have this. That we have leaders in our nation that are looking at TikTok and saying, this, this is of communism. This is destroying the minds of our youth. We talked about that on Wednesday night. How China doesn't have TikTok in China. The, their version of TikTok is a totally different name and it's their algorithm is based on education not on the mindless comedy that 175 million Americans watch on TikTok for three or four hours of just stupid comedy stuff dumbing you down wanting to be entertained Leonard Ravenhill said this perfectly he said entertainment is one of the, dual, the, the Satan's end time tools when we're so focused on entertainment and we're not focused on worship. We're here at the end of the church age. We're here at the end. We're at the end. And in the twinkle of an eye, I'm telling you, He will return. Receive that word in Jesus' name. Give God praise in His house. Amen.